Professor Lewis, if Iran, as you say, is racing for regional supremacy and upending, destabilizing Arab regimes with the same energy that it intends to destroy Israel, what does that mean for places like Gaza and the West Bank? Are they, uh, to what extent are they part of the Iranian plan, or should, how should we think about the closer uh, battlefields to home? Yes, I think one might um, divide them into two groups. On the one hand, you have the groups that are themselves Shia. Shia are an important part of the population of Syria and Lebanon. Hezbollah is a Shiite organization. So their link with Iran and with the Iranian revolution is clear and obvious. There are no Shia Palestinians. And as I said before, where the, where the distinction doesn't exist, it's not important. And that is why it is possible for groups of people in Muslim Africa, which is solidly Sunni, or among the Palestinians who are solidly Sunni, to take up the Iranian cause. And that is why I think we find that Hamas has accepted support from Iran and is rallying to the Iranian cause, because for them, in their historical religious awareness, the Sunni-Shia difference is not that important. So therefore, on balance, because there's a major debate, Professor Lewis, that has been going on about this conflict, meaning in the narrow sense the Palestinian-Israeli conflict as a part of a subset of the Arab-Israeli conflict, that we're really in an ethno-national conflict, some say, we're in a political conflict, some say, but from what you're saying, to what extent are we really in a religious conflict? I think that in the Muslim perception, it's basically a religious conflict. It is to decide who will dominate Islam, whose version of Islam will prevail in the Islamic world. And there is no doubt that the Iranians have plans going far beyond the Middle East, uh, extending eastwards into South and Southeast Asia, westwards into Muslim Africa. And there are signs of that in various places. The impact has been enormous. As I said, it had the same kind of impact as the French and Russian revolutions in their days, with the same kind of response. There is one other point, which I think I will mention, if you would allow me. And that is what, I'm, what I would call the apocalyptic aspect. In Islam, as in Judaism, as in Christianity, there is a scenario for the end of time, when the final battle takes place between the forces of good and the forces of evil, which for Christians, Jews, and Muslims alike means between us and them, the us and being differently defined, the them being more or less the same. Um, in the Muslim view, no, and let me correct that, in the view of a certain section within the Iranian leadership, it's not by any means unanimous, that time is now. For a group called the Hojatiyah, whose main leader is Ahmadinejad, the apocalyptic time has come. The Mahdi, the Muslim Messiah, is already here. The final battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil has already begun. That is extremely important for another not immediately related reason. And that is the question of Iran's nuclear weapon. The Soviet Union had nuclear weapons right through the Cold War, but neither side used them because both sides were aware that if either one did, the other would do the same, and this would lead to mutual destruction. MAD, as it was known at the time, Mutual Assured Destruction, was the main deterrent preventing the use of nuclear weapons by the Soviets. For most of the Iranian leadership, MAD would work as a deterrent. But for Ahmadinejad and his group, with their apocalyptic mindset, Mutual Assured Destruction is not a deterrent, it's an inducement. They believe that the end of time has come the final battles are already beginning, and the sooner the better, so that the good can go to enjoy the delights of paradise in the divine brothel in the sky, and <clears throat> the wicked, and that means all of us here, can go to eternal damnation. On this point of Iranian ascendancy and dedication to the end of days, mm. you have written 
especially since 1976, when you wrote The Return of Islam, exactly two years before the, Iran the Islamic Revolution in Iran, first Islamic Revolution in Iran, most, many in the West of your colleagues have not seen it the way you've seen it. They, they have, they have... Not immediately. <laughs> you've expressed concern in your writings from the return of Islam to, uh, to the roots of Muslim rage, nice. even to <clears throat> other more recent articles, that the West is not getting something about Islam. What are they missing? It is uh, normal for human beings to judge others by ourselves. We are now in the 21st century of the Christian era. They are in the early 15th century of the Muslim era. It's a different religion based on entirely different historical experience, different message, different teaching. And it is therefore a grave error to do what people normally do, and that is judge others by ourselves. It doesn't work, and it's dangerously misleading. If one looks at Islam, from within. Uh, for that it's necessary to learn at least one Muslim language, something which many Middle East experts, in fact most Middle East experts in the West, for one reason or another, are reluctant to do. If one learns the languages and reads what they say among themselves and understands it in the context of their own history, their own culture, their own background, then I think it's not too difficult to understand what is happening then why is it if Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, the Palestinian Authority and the West Bank are publicly condemning Iran and their servants, their Sunni and Shiite uh, servants, shall we call them, or proxies or surrogates, why is the Arab establishment unwilling to fight when they are so frightened of what they perceive as an ex existential threat to them? Because the Arab establishment, as you call it, consists mainly of rather unpopular autocracies. I mean, looking at it from a Western point of view, if you look around the Middle East, you could divide the countries into two, two groups. Countries with pro-Western, and let's be more specific, countries with pro-American governments and therefore anti-American populations, and countries with anti-American governments and therefore pro-American populations the second consisting essentially of Iran. Um, we and the West are seen as the sponsors, the aiders and the betters of the tyrannies that rule over them. Now, I said a moment or two ago that the regimes now in these countries, the rulers of Egypt and others, see the threat and are therefore turning to Israel. That does not mean that the populations of those countries see it that way or are turning to Israel. Uh, take the specific case of what's been happening in Gaza. Um, Mubarak and his government and his whole ruling apparatus feel mortally threatened by the, um, <clears throat> uh, the pro-Iranian presence in the Gaza Strip and are very happy to see it demolished. But that is not the case with a large part of the Egyptian population. I mean, the, the Hamas people in Gaza are a part of the Muslim Brothers. The Muslim Brothers constitute a very significant opposition group within Egypt and the Egyptian population. And there too, since the Sunni Shia business is not important, the revolutionary appeal, even the apocalyptic appeal of Shiism, has some impact. 